The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com. Florida history and culture from the Ice Age to the Space Age is on display at the Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, located at 2201 Michigan Avenue in Cocoa. The museum has nature trails through 20 acres of three Florida ecosystems. The People of Windover exhibition features information about Florida's prehistoric past and actual artifacts used between 7,000 and 8,000 years ago. More information at brevardmuseum.org. Welcome to Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. We're at the Pioneer Settlement for the Creative Arts in Barberville, located in Volusia County. The Barber family was very successful in Florida's cattle industry. The barber mizell family feud of 1870 demonstrates how Florida was every bit as wild as the Wild West. On February 21, 1870, Sheriff David Mizell, his son Will, and brother Morgan came onto the property of Moses Barber to serve an arrest warrant. Tensions between the Barbers and Mizells had been growing for years, and the sheriff had been warned that if he set foot on Barber land, he would be killed. When the group stopped at Bull Creek, a shot was fired from behind some bushes. Sheriff David Mizell was killed, becoming the first casualty of the barber mizell family feud. Bull Creek is where the ambush took place, and Bull Creek runs right through the property here in Forever Florida. Some of the history books puts it close to Holapa, which is just a few miles up the road. So this is exactly where that first shot in the big feud happened. Moses Barber came to Florida from Georgia in 1833 and originally settled near what is now McClenney, Florida. He would become one of Florida's most successful cattlemen, and by the time the Civil War started in 1860, he had 100 slaves, more than 20,000 acres of land, and nearly $120,000 worth of other property. Barber was able to build his cattle empire using the descendants of livestock brought to Florida by the Spanish in the 1500s. Florida is the first area to get cattle brought over by the Spanish. We're ahead of the people out west. We were the first to get horses, we were the first to get hogs, and all of that, you know, all that begins to develop. Uh, you know, the people down here are, are cattlemen, not cowboys, because you have to be a real man to work the cattle. And the, they're also called cow hunters because, you know, you did have, you know, they used open range, you'd have to hunt up your cattle. Well, some of the uh, history books refer to the, what we call cracker cattle, as like donkeys, <laughs> in that they're very small, they're bony. Some of the information all says they're not very good for either beef or milk, but they're very hardy. They've got good um, immune systems, external parasites, internal parasites, and that's true of the horses too, the Florida cracker horses, which are the, of that Spanish bloodline. The agriculture industry in Florida, let me say, was built on cattle ranching initially, and that was built on the back of these little cracker horses, but they're narrower, they're more agile. Um, around the Holopa, Kenansville area, um, big ranches around here, those little cracker horses could handle it. If you took like what is today known as a quarter horse, they would never make it here. Too big, can't, can't um, herd. Their primary job was herding 
although some some folks, the cow hunters, could rope off of them, their primary um, advantage, the primary advantage they had was that they were smaller and could herd and get into the palmetto stands and so forth. Before the American Revolution, three brothers from France named William, Luke, and David Moselle came to North Carolina to settle. William's descendants eventually moved to South Georgia, Luke's to Alabama, and David's to Florida. By the time David's grandson, also named David, settled near what is now Lake City in the 1830s, the spelling of his name was changed to Mizell. Both the Mizell family and the Barber family first came to Florida in the 1830s. This was the height of the conflict between the Seminole Indians in Florida and the United States government. During the Second Seminole War, a series of forts were built throughout Florida. The forts were situated about a day's walk apart, so the soldiers would have some place safe to sleep and store their provisions at night. Many Florida cities grew up around Seminole War forts. For example, Orlando grew up around Fort Gatlin, Tampa was established at the site of Fort Brooke, and Sanford was the site of Fort Mellon. Many Florida cities retain their Seminole War Fort names, such as Fort Pierce, Fort Lauderdale, and Fort Myers. I mean, I'm really sympathetic to the whole point of view about the, how the Seminoles had their land taken away. On the other hand, an attack by the Seminoles was terrifying, you know. Um, they did scalp people, they, they used sort of guerrilla war tactics. So we know that that happened and that I think it's one of the reasons, I mean, if you were, if you were a pioneer here, you had to be a pretty tough customer. I mean, you had to be able to deal with dangerous circumstances. It wasn't Little House on the Prairie, you know. I mean, it was, um, especially in the 1830s and 40s and, and 50s. Now, when they ran the Indians out, when they got the Indians and took them, Mose grabbed their cattle. But he had a pretty good band of men that could do that. And the cattle weren't branded and marked. So he just, he did that. And that's how he got his his money and his big, he, he, he owned cattle from North and South Carolina all the way down to below Okeechobee. He had cattle all along there. And, and they, they kept them branded because in those days, you could brand a cow, put your brand on it. If it didn't have brand on it, you could do that. Moses Barber had a reputation for not being afraid of the Seminoles. From his homestead in North Florida, he ran his cattle farther and farther into what was still Indian territory. Moses' brother William was killed by Seminole Indians in 1841. David Mizell's family was attacked by Seminole Indians in 1838, and two of his family members were killed. David enlisted in the Army and spent some time at Fort Christmas. He liked what would become the Orlando area and settled here. The home located in Harry P. Lou Botanical Gardens has been expanded over the years, but it was originally the Mizell family homestead. As Moses Barber kept pushing his cattle farther and farther south, his family established homes near Kissimmee. Mary Ida Bass Barber Shearheart was born into the Mizell family, but married a barber. She still lives on property that was part of the Barber homestead in central Florida. I was born Mary Ida Bass, right here in this house. I sleep in the same room where I was born 91 years ago. And I married Bill Barber and uh, had, my, had four children, lived 26 years with him. And uh, then uh, I, I was a single only a couple of years and I married this Cecil Sherhart that was from Texas. The barber Mizell family feud of 1870 involved more than just the Barbers and Mizells. The Yates, Bass, and Overstreet families are among those who also participated in the conflict. Here at Fort Christmas Historical Park in East Orange County, the pioneer homes of some of those families are preserved. And I was related to all of those people, see. They were all my family. My grandmother was uh, an Overstreet and Yates. And, uh, of course, like I said, I married into the Barbers, and I picked up a few families there. And I just felt like I was sort of part of it. And 
nobody, like I said, had ever written anything about it. It was just talked about. And I wanted it on paper so that people would really know what happened instead of writing these books about things that were not the least bit connected or like I thought that they should be. And that's why I wrote my book. Anytime the, a roundup, uh, all the families came together and they do on one for this family, and when that was done, then they'd move and, and uh, help out with the other families. They all helped because they couldn't afford to hire uh, as many cowboys to work the cows as they needed, or cow men. Yeah, they're very dependent on each other. Uh, not only in the, for work, but also everything they did. They all went to church together and uh, so it was pretty bad when you got two families that didn't agree. Frederick Remington, he will do a series of pictures which are very popular. You don't see them very much outside of Florida, but they're very popular. Florida, they're used a lot for illustrations. And a couple of them are of the range wars. The guy sitting in ambush waiting for a rustler to come by or fighting over cattle they've stolen. With the open range, it's easy to come along and change brands. It's easy for me to come along in the spring and just brand all the calves I find rather than just the ones that are following the cow with my brand on it. And so there was a lot of, you know, you know cattle wars and range wars. Life was challenging for Florida pioneers of the 19th century. Even well into the 20th century, there were few modern conveniences. If you live in Florida with no air conditioning, uh, no running water other than a pitcher pump. You can imagine that times were tough and the people had to be tough or they wouldn't make it. Um, I'm not quite that old, but when I was a youngster, I had neighbors that had no electricity and we had no air conditioning. But, and now I look back on it and I don't know how we did it because if I had to go without air conditioning now, it would be very difficult. In January 1861, Florida became the third state to secede from the United States, helping to begin the American Civil War. Florida became the biggest supplier of beef to the Confederate Army. During the Civil War, Moses Barber lost much of his land and cattle and his slaves. He also lost his son Isaac. Two of David Mizell's sons died in the Civil War, Thomas and Joshua. His son John became a captain in the Confederate Army, and his son David was also a soldier but was ill for most of the war. The Civil War helped to intensify the differences between the Barbers and the Mizells. According to the lore I've heard from Barber descendants particularly, the, the families really hated each other even before they came to Florida. And uh, this, is, this is sort of the Barber point of view, but that the Mizells uh, considered themselves better than the Barbers. And, uh, but when they arrived here, and, and certainly in the period that we're talking about, and after the Civil War, the Mizells were associated with the Reconstruction government. Uh, sheriff David Mizell was the sheriff of Orange County, and his brother John was a judge. And so they represented um, the Reconstruction government, the Republican Reconstruction government, that a lot of the cattlemen who were probably by heritage uh, Confederates and, and Southern Democrats, uh, you know, hated. So the Barbers were sort of, at, at least as it's usually explained, the Barbers were sort of on the old Confederacy side and the, the Mizells were, had accepted the position of being an authority from the Reconstruction Republican government. So they were really on different sides of, of feeling after the Civil War. Following the Civil War, Cuba became a large market for Florida beef. Moses Barber and other Florida cattlemen would send their cattle to Cuba on boats. After the Civil War, money really didn't have much value. Certainly Confederate money had no value. So what became very valuable, even more so than it was before, were cattle. Because uh, the cattlemen could sell cattle to Cuba uh, for get Spanish gold. So cattle sort of became the currency, and that led to a lot of cattle rustling and cattle feuds. 
Tensions between the Barber family and the Mizell family escalated during the late 1860s with other cattle families taking one side or the other. Moses Barber believed that Mizell family friend George Bass had stolen some of his cattle and confronted him about it. The Mizells controlled the sheriff's office and the courts, so Barber and members of his family were charged with false imprisonment for holding Bass against his will. After decades of lawlessness on the Florida frontier, Mizells charged Barbers with a series of crimes, including arson, tax evasion, and polygamy. Well, he had women everywhere. Mose, Mose was a woman's man, and uh, he had, he had uh, women in, in Ocala and Tampa and all around. And he did, he did a lot of moving around. He didn't, he really didn't. He built a house for his wives, but he didn't stay home very much. So he, he practically lived on his horse. <laughs> it's interesting about from the point of view of women in history that, that the barber boys, uh, Mose and his sons and everything were, um, were friendly with some of the camp followers, including one, one of the most famous ones, Jane Green. There's a Jane Green swamp named after her now. And she was uh, apparently involved, according to legend anyway, with Mose Barber uh, Jr., the son. And um, so I, I don't know that, it, I've read that there were some charges of adultery against Mose, Mose Barber Sr. that had to do with uh, some of the ladies that would hang around the camp, and also I think he was reputed to have had more than one wife at different <laughs> different parts of his empire, different outposts of the, the so-called barber widows. After the Civil War, Moses Barber refused to pay what he considered to be unfair taxes to the U.S. government. David Mizell allegedly responded by taking some of Barber's cattle to compensate for the unpaid debt. As legend has it, Moses Barber said that if David Mizell ever came near his property again, he would be killed. Early in 1870, Judge John Mizell issued an arrest warrant for Moses Barber based on a complaint by Robert Bullock for an unpaid bill of sale for cattle. Sheriff David Mizell was sent to arrest Mose. David Mizell, his son Will, and David's brother Morgan went to Barber property at Bull Creek where David Mizell was shot and killed. As he lay dying, David Mizell asked that his death not be avenged. His brother John had other plans. Judge John Mizell ordered that members of the Barber family be arrested or killed. As many as 13 people were killed as part of the barber Mizell family feud, Moses Barber left the area. This is something that these families have kept, kept secret for a very long time. I mean, if somebody did participate in a revenge killing or something, they, they didn't write a letter about it, they didn't put it in a diary, they didn't, you know, it, what's, what's known is pretty much just what got passed down in family lore. Today, the cattle industry is alive and well in the area where the Barber Mizell family feud of 1870 took place. Many of the, of the um, cattle ranches today use more modern uh, technology and so forth. We here on the grounds of Crescent J Ranch in Forever, Florida, still use the old ways. So we move the, uh, the cattle on horseback and we use cracker horses and um, uh, try to maintain some of that heritage. To me, the part that has changed is they're more educated now. It's become a business. So they got to, you know, they go to college to learn business, how to manage cattle, you know, the diseases that we have now that they didn't have back then. And uh, so it's more of a business now than it was then. But it's still, you know, the basic part is still the same. I mean, you still got to go out. You got to be able to read cows, know what cows are thinking and, uh, and uh, handle them that way. On the spot where the Barber Mizell family feud began in 1870, autistic young people, veterans, and abused women are today receiving help in creative ways. Dean Van Camp and I have a program called Eye of a Horse, that's E-Y-E -E, of a Horse. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and Dean is a lifetime 
um, horse trainer and horse expert. So we have brought our skills and talents and experiences together to form this special program that we call Nature Exposure Animal Assisted Psychotherapy. And we help folks that have challenges in life from all different populations. We bring those uh, clients out here and they interact with the cows and horses. And the purpose is, uh, number one, get them out in nature. We have 4,700 acres of beautiful untouched preserves here. That's just the backdrop of our program. The, the meat and potatoes of it is the interaction that these folks are able to have with, in many cases, untouched horses that um, have never been worked with, are not trained, and never had a halter on. And so the, what we call our students or clients um, go out in the herd and attempt to join the herd. So this means they have to be looking very closely for the nonverbal cues. They have to be able to read intentionality in the animals. So they're learning actually about life. They don't realize they are, but this is experiential, hands-on learning as, at its best. And then we debrief the various sessions and they learn how to apply the lessons that they have learned while interacting with the cows or horses to their own life. The I Have a Horse program, uh, Dr. Sandra Wise actually was, is the founder of that. And uh, she allowed me to be part of that, which I'm very appreciative of. But uh, uh, just getting young folks out in nature, veterans that have PTSD, uh, abused women, such things as that out into nature. It, it's amazing. We just take them out and set them down on a pasture, and pretty soon there's cows around them, or there's 20 head of horses just looking at them, you know, smelling them, sniffing them. And it, it's amazing what it does for those people. You don't even have to say anything, you don't have to speak. It, it, it just it changes their whole outlook on life and uh, makes them realize that there is a life there. You know, there's, there's something that can be had there. So that, that's the part that amazes me is how nature, I mean, I've been out here my whole entire life and uh, I, I maybe take it for granted sometimes because it's just, I've been out here my whole entire life. But I, I can really see that and appreciate it more when I see people with those kind of problems and stuff come out here and how that it, it just kind of opens them up. Today, the Barber and Mizell families get along much better. Mary Ida Bass Barber Shearheart and her husband Bill Barber had four children, bringing both sides of the feud together. I remember when I married my husband, they all said, well, the Barber-Mizell feud's back on again. <laughs> this small cemetery is located at what is now Harry P. Lou Botanical Gardens in Orlando. The oldest grave here belongs to Sheriff David Mizell, the first casualty of the Barber Mizell family feud of 1870. It serves as a reminder of a dark chapter in Florida history, but great work being done today at the Pioneer Settlement for the Creative Arts in Barberville, Fort Christmas Historical Park in East Orange County, Forever Florida in Osceola County, and here at Harry P. Lou Botanical Gardens provides hope for the future. You've been watching Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. Visit us anytime on the web at myfloridahistory.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Brokemarkle.
The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by... Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com. Florida history and culture from the Ice Age to the Space Age is on display at the Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, located at 2201 Michigan Avenue in Cocoa. The museum has nature trails through 20 acres of three Florida ecosystems. The People of Windover exhibition features information about Florida's prehistoric past and actual artifacts used between 7,000 and 8,000 years ago. More information at brevardmuseum.org. The Florida Historical Society Press publishes books on a variety of topics relating to our state's diverse history and culture. FHS Press titles include Life and Death at Windover, Excavations of a 7,000-Year-Old Pond Cemetery, The Voyages of Ponce de Leon, Scholarly Perspectives, Hollow Victory, a novel of the Second Seminole War, Stetson Kennedy's Palmetto Country, and Walk in Lawton. More information at fhspress.org. 